Hi, everybody. Uh, happy to introduce you here to our next session in track two. Uh, we have Tracy Panic from Levi Strauss and Company, who's going to uh, talk about the role of history in the corporate archives at Levi Strauss and Company. So take it away, Tracy. Thank you. And greetings, everyone from San Francisco. It's a sunny day here today, and I'm happy to be here to talk a little bit about what I do at Levi Strauss and Company and the role of history here and uh, how we use our dam system. So let's get started with a bit of background. Uh, Levi Strauss and Company is one of the oldest American apparel, <clears throat> apparel brands, excuse me, that's still around today, 171 years of history, and uh, it dates back to 1853. Just grab a drink there. Um, it, of course, was uh, was named for our founder. This is a very young Levi Strauss who arrived uh, in America uh, in the 1800s, first to New York, and uh, and then would eventually make his way out to California during the California Gold Rush in 1853. He set up a business. It was a dry goods wholesale business and had a whole uh, a whole group of salesmen that you can see here that had territories all over the American West from as far north as uh, the state of Washington to uh, south to New Mexico and Arizona and uh, out to California, of course. And it was those salesmen who would service the needs of, of the customers, the retail customers, one of whom uh, was a tailor in Reno, Nevada. And there's a photo of him uh, on the right. His name was Jacob Davis. He was a customer of Levi's, a customer of the company. And in a letter in uh, 1872, he wrote to, to the company in San Francisco, ordering some supplies for his tailor shop and also letting them know about an interesting innovation that he had come up with. It was a, a tiny but important innovation, uh, a little piece of metal that would be added to the uh, pockets of pants to make them stronger. He had been making these unusual riveted pants in Reno, Nevada, near where the Comstock silver load had been discovered in the, in the late 1800s. And he uh, could not keep up with uh, the amount of sales that he had. They were selling like hotcakes. And uh, he wanted a partner to take out a patent with him for this unusual process. So he asked, uh, the company and Levi, if they wanted to take out this riveted pocketing process. And he also knew he would benefit from working with Levi Strauss, this uh, wholesaler who had connections all over the American West. Levi hadn't done any manufacturing up, in, uh, up, up until this point. He'd been a wholesaler selling everything from fabric and underwear to, um, to umbrellas. Uh, but he agreed. And on May 20th, 1873, a U.S. patent was granted for an improvement in fastening pocket openings. Uh, at Levi Strauss, we call this a 501 day or the birth of the modern blue jean. And we celebrate it every May 20th. In fact, last year, uh, it was our 150th anniversary of this patent. And uh, the modern blue jean, which was the origins of this, this patent, uh, is now uh, something that, that is found all over the world, but has its origins, of course, in San Francisco. And all the little dots that you see on the left on that sketch were the locations of the original rivets. Here are a few of, of the uh, original, uh, the early people to wear those riveted denim pants or blue jeans. They would have been blue collar workers. Everyone from miners and railroad engineers to farmers and uh, hunters, anyone who needed tough work pants. And uh, we are very fortunate in the archives at Levi Strauss to still have some of those early pairs of Levi's uh, worn by those blue collar workers, as you can see here. Uh, our archives has a range of materials, uh, mainly our products, garments, everything from the earliest blue jeans in the world that you can see over on the left to a 1930s leather jacket that was worn by Albert Einstein when he immigrated to the United States 
And uh, he wore the Levi Strauss coat so frequently that he was actually featured wearing it on the cover of Time magazine in 1938. And it's one of the gems of our archives. Uh, today, we continue to add pieces to the collection. It's one of my favorite parts of what I do. Uh, this is a picture of, of me in Leadville, Colorado, several years ago, and I'm standing in front of the shed uh, where a pair of early Levi's was found and we acquired. And uh, this is what they look like. They still have our rivets on there. And we continue to add early pieces to the collection. Uh, we also add some of the newest pieces to our collection. And here's an example. A couple of years ago, we did a collaboration with the Simpsons and you can see those products. So we have a range of materials dating back to the 1800s, but all the way up to present in our archives. The primary users of our collection are the designers at Levi Strauss and Company who use pieces for inspiration. Everything from a label, and you can see a couple of our designers taking a picture of the inside of uh, the coat that was worn at the uh, Lake Placid Olympics in 1980. Uh, you can see other folks, uh, that's our graphics team, our graphic tees team uh, up at the top looking at some 1940s denim banners, getting inspiration for pieces as well. Uh, other folks uh, and designers that, that look and uh, use our archives regularly, uh, you can see um, E. Will on the left and Janai Jones, two of our designers in the in the men's bottoms group who do work there. And we also host folks like our, our accessories team. Uh, that's who you can see over on the right there, uh, looking at some of the belt buckles in our uh, belt collection. In addition to getting inspiration for new pieces, we also do reproductions of pieces in our archives. And here you see a picture of uh, designer Paul O'Neill who handles our Levi's vintage clothing. And he's measuring the buttons for uh, the reproduction of our Albert Einstein jacket. So uh, what Paul does and the designers do are take pieces for the vintage clothing collection and reproduce them uh, stitch for stitch, we like to say. Uh, this is what the, uh, the jacket looked like when it came back from auction at Christie's. Uh, back in 2016, and you can see the paddle that's there uh, that was also part of the reproduction package. Uh, people could get a reproduction a couple of years after we acquired it and brought it to the archives. So a couple of the other things that we do in, uh, in the archives and as my role as historian, we have a, a small museum at our, at our headquarters where we host uh, guests uh, VIPs and uh, folks who do collaborations with us, and of course, employees. And we also do exhibitions uh, all around uh, the world. Uh, this is our latest exhibition. Uh, this was on display last September in London at the Queer Britain Museum. And we had pieces on display there, uh, ranging from a 501 uh, worn by Freddie Mercury, the uh, head of uh, Queen, to Harvey Milk, who was the first openly gay public official in California and an icon in the, um, in the queer movement today. Uh, my role as historian also involves me making sure that the story that we tell out in the public um, is accurate. So working with media outlets uh, like the uh, Los Angeles Times here uh, to ensure that what they say, at least we do our best to do this, what they say is accurate and also to make sure that what we share uh, publicly as a company is, is accurate. And in some cases, we've been our, um, our own um, worst enemy there, uh, sharing details that aren't always accurate. And I've circled on the bottom of the ad on the left a, a note that says since 1850, and uh, turned out that Levi Strauss didn't arrive in San Francisco until 1853, but we'd been conveniently using that 1850 number. So looking at those kinds of materials that help us to know exactly what the dates are um, and being accurate is part of what I do. I produce a lot of uh, material on social platforms, everything from TikTok um, all over the world to published media and internal um, and internal platforms as well to share our heritage. 
And uh, another social platform that we use quite heavily is our Levi's YouTube channel. We actually launched a couple of years ago a From the Levi's Archive series, exploring in great depth some of our very interesting stories. Uh, and as you can see in there, uh, some of the stories included uh, a, a piece that we did on uh, one of the oldest black motorcycle clubs in the United States who wore Levi's as their uh, unofficial club uniform or a story about how we do conservation on an 1800s jacket. And then of course, uh, media, uh, I would do a lot of work with media and our archives is used to help supply imagery and other material to media. Uh, last year, for the 150th anniversary of the 501 gene. Um, this is an example of some of the stories that we shared in press all over the world. So knowing that we have uh, so many uses of our archives, it was extremely important for us to have a digital asset management system to allow us to quickly and efficiently get to material. So I'm going to spend uh, a few minutes just talking about the dam that we created to improve access to the archives. And when I started at Levi Strauss uh, 10 years ago, uh, this is how our designers and others had uh, were able to get access to the archives. It was a very manual process. They would literally take binders off the shelf. You can see two designers there on the back shelves are uh, a whole group of binders. And we had, there were uh, handwritten descriptions of items in the archives. And of course, was, this was not very efficient. It also meant that you had to be in person to be able to access this. And that all changed uh, when I helped move us into the 21st century and to create a dam uh, system. Uh, this meant carefully uh, describing materials in our, 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 uh, our collection. There's Laura O'Hara, our archivist there. And uh, just to give you a bit more context, uh, Laura and I are the only permanent staff uh, in the archives. We do a lot of things, but there's just the two of us. So we have to be uh, efficient in, uh, in what we do to be able to get our work done. So when we uh, launched our, prepare to launch our dam system, uh, we spent uh, weeks and months scanning material uh, that's common to most archives, uh, paper material um, from the corporate collection, which meant everything from letters to advertisements and photographs. And then the largest part of our dam system, because uh, garments are the biggest part of our uh, archives, was photographing the, the, uh, the artifacts in the collection, our clothing. And uh, the first year that we set it up, we had a month-long photo session uh, where we photographed, uh, we did hero shots front and back of our, our garments and then detail shots, all of which became the, um, the beginnings of our system. Uh, our, our content management system. And you can see an example of some of the many photographs that we, that we took. By the time we'd finished our work on, uh, with the scanning and the photographing, that month long photo, uh, photo, um, shoot that we did, we launched our very first uh, digital asset management system. Uh, we call it the Virtual Vault Digital Archives. Uh, we have the physical vault museum and the virtual vault is the way that our uh, that our employees can access the system anywhere in the world. And because we're a global system, this was extremely important. We spent a lot of time uh, organizing this system so that it could be easily uh, accessed by our um, our designers and other employees. And we also organized it in the way that they used it most frequently. So because garments, for instance, are our most heavily used part of the archives, they were the first, uh, the first item in the categories that we created, followed by the others um, beyond that. The system was very intuitive uh, for folks to use. You can search either by keyword, just like you would on a regular web browser, or you can also click into any one of those categories. They're organized underneath that, uh, mainly by uh, chronological order and other um, other categories and themes where it made sense. So what lessons did we learn? I've given you just a, a bare um, tip of the iceberg uh, look at how we created the system, but I'll share some of the things that we learned in the process for creating uh, that um, digital asset management system. We set deadlines. Uh, for us, 
we wanted to have a system up and running in six months. And uh, from that deadline, we worked backwards and created uh, what would be our milestones for having things completed, like having the photo, uh, the photo shoot, um, getting scanned items together. We also created very efficient processes. Uh, and for us, that meant uh, when we were doing the photo, uh, the photo shoot, for instance, that we uh, essentially used an assembly line process, having things ready to go so that uh, they could be photographed quickly, front, back, and then um, and then those uh, detailed elements. I will say that in the process of doing this, we also consulted with the users that that uh, most heavily use the archives to get a sense of what they needed to see in the system and to make sure that we were uh, that we were capturing the things that they needed in the photos especially. So creating efficient processes was extremely important. Uh, we also connected with vendors very early on to help improve our, work, our workflows. And that meant that we had our photographers, for instance, um, talking to those who were going to be uploading the materials into our asset management system to make sure that they had the file types that they needed, uh, the resolution that we needed, all of those things. Uh, up front, we wanted to make sure we had in place so that uh, the end product would be what we needed. We had regular weekly check-in calls. And uh, for whatever uh, the system is going to be for uh, anyone of, of you who might embark on this process, having regular uh, calls with all of those who were involved was an, uh, an important way to keep on track. And finally, for us, beta testing uh, to make sure that uh, the users who were using our, our digital asset management system were uh, were able to get in and search efficiently. Um, from that beta testing, we made a number of changes uh, to improve uh, the way that they looked at items and the way we organized things. Uh, those are just a few of the things that we learned in the process of creating the system. And of course, we're a number of years out from that initial uh, the initial launch of our virtual vault digital archives. Um, in recent years, a couple of years ago, uh, we uh, added to the content in our system. And by the way, I will say that we are, uh, our virtual vault has over 150,000 digital assets. So there are uh, plenty, uh, plenty of there's plenty of content for those who get in there to look at. A couple of years ago, we started doing 3D imaging for the first time, uh, putting uh, some of our products on mannequins and scanning them with lasers uh, and adding that to our system to um, make the content in the virtual vault much more robust and uh, interesting. And last year, we even uh, tested a little bit of AI with uh, the design team at, uh, at the company and uh, did that uh, to try and figure out how we could, uh, for instance, identify certain patterns that the designers might be looking for. Um, I will say that it was a very, uh, just barely getting our feet wet process, but it does give us some ideas for what to look forward to in the future. Um, and I'm excited to, to say that having that digital asset management system for us has been a key to getting our work done, being able to do it efficiently, being able to share our content with others outside of San Francisco and all over the world. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. So I'm going to hand it over uh, back over to you, Heather. Thanks, Tracy. Um, I think there are some First of all, just questions about the collection, which is fascinating, and I think we all uh, want to know more about. How many physical assets or garments are in the collection? Well, we have thousands. Uh, I will tell you that we have uh, we we have limited space in San Francisco, so we have uh, a one thousand, just over a thousand boxes on site. Um, each of them with multiple garments in some cases. And then we also have an off-site collection, which includes two automobiles, which we can't possibly store on site, and uh, over 10,000 boxes of garments and other material. It's a pretty pretty expansive collection. Yeah, I hope you get to try some on. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> what about, do you have, what else is in the archive? Are there personal papers from Levi Strauss? Is there corporate archives? Um, are, do the, are those also available through this system? They are. So uh, the garments are the largest part, but we have any everything that you would imagine from a corporate archive. So we have advertising, we have uh, photographs, we have early invoices that date back to the 1850s. 
We have uh, customer letters uh, back when people wrote letters and, and didn't just email. Uh, so we have most of the um, paper materials that we expect that we um, that you would expect. Um, one caveat I will say uh, in San Francisco, 1906, the great San Francisco earthquake and fire. It burned our headquarters down. So a lot of the very early material from the company uh, is is um, uh, not no longer there. Uh, and we've had to uh, do our best to um, to pull together what what there has been. But some of those early years are pretty, um, pretty rare. Uh, to have some of those materials. That's why putting this stuff in the system is so important, I guess. Um, are there, Absolutely. what kind of media do you put in your system? You mentioned 3D scans, but um, do you also do like videos or um, these social yeah. media assets that you produce, do they go back into the system? Yeah, great question. Uh, we have, uh, we, a few years ago, we digitized our U.S radio and television advertising collections. So you can see videos in uh, in the virtual vault, uh, our system. Uh, we also have um, uh, some of the material that we produce for social media, like all of the YouTube series um, materials and content that'll go in, in the system or uh, items that are produced, um, audio visual material that's produced by the archives. Yeah. Cool. Um, there's a couple of questions that are sort of about balancing the dam as an internal tool versus kind of a public tool. And it sounds like when you started this journey, it was very much an internal facing tool for the designers and um, access and things. But now you've kind of launched this digital vault and maybe things are now more public facing. Is, is that kind of where you're going with this or is it still primarily an internal tool? Yeah, well, to clarify, it's it's still an internal tool. So you have to have credentials. Uh, it's mainly the employees who use it. However, we do partner with institutions um, or as needed on a case by case basis. So uh, we've done a number of exhibitions uh, at uh, museums and institutions around the world. Uh, we're getting ready to open an exhibit in Milano, for instance, and we've given the curators access to the system so they can uh, review and then we can collaborate on, on what's gonna be on display. So uh, for us, the system is internal, but we do provide access uh, where it's needed to you know, select, select folks. Cool. Um, so there's a question about metadata and do you have another system where you track kind of archival uh, metadata uh, or is it kind of all within this system? Yeah. A uh, good question. So one of the things that we um, that we did when we started the system, I mentioned that we had uh, binders, handwritten notes that we started from. Uh, when we began our journey to create a digital asset management system, it meant converting all of those handwritten notes uh, to an Excel spreadsheet, and then eventually pull those into an, uh, a database. And uh, that's what we use to populate a lot of the um, information that we have in, in the virtual vault. I will tell you that, that metadata tagging is still an ongoing process. So uh, we always make improvements. Uh, we, um, when we are using the system and we find that we need to do um, to expand the descriptions or to tag a particular uh, uh, let's say garment lines that that are of interest to our designers then we go back and we do that so it's a never-ending process we've gotten better uh we continue to have a photo shoot once a year to photograph new items that have been added to the collection or to photograph items uh, mainly from off-site that we didn't uh, originally photograph so it's a never-ending story the metadata <laughs> Um, and I, I think maybe some of our viewers are curious, you know, being a corporate archive, you know, many of us in the cultural heart space are thinking a lot about digital preservation and, uh, you know, professional standards and things like that. Um, are you doing anything with digital preservation? Is that part of the system? Is that a separate consideration? Is that not as much of a concern? The digital preservation. So, um, well, let me just mention something about being uh, corporate archives. And I think this is, um, uh, for us, it's, it's one of the things that we have to always keep forefront in our mind. Um, being in a business, we have to always demonstrate our relevance. Uh, for, for me, having a system that is efficient, that can be used, uh, and uh, for users, it has to be easy. 
having that is essential for us to be able to stay relevant. We always have to, to be able to provide content easily and quickly. And so that's super important. Uh, the digital preservation, we, we work with uh, a partner who helps us with our, with our system and rely on their expertise to help us with that. Um, in fact, because there's only a staff of two, uh, that was super important um, as one of the, uh, the requirements for being able to work with us. Um, because, yeah, it's super important, but we don't always have uh, the time to do that ourselves with just two of us. Yeah, and you're, you're not like damn staff, right? You're the archive staff in general, right? So you had a lot of hats that you wear. Um, interesting question about integrations and whether this data is at all linked with any product information management system the company might have or whether mm -hmm. there are other integrations um, in place. Uh, not formally. It's, it's certainly a possibility. Uh, we intentionally um, separated from the, the other main system that we have uh, here at the company, and that's so that uh, we could uh, manage the resources on our own. We, you know, as archivists um, and historians, we have a particular method for, for how we handle that that's different from, from the way, uh, say, the, the merchandisers will handle, will handle things. So we do keep in the metadata, we do keep key elements of data that will help us to be able to, uh, to find those items in the, in the whole system at the larger system at the company. But no, this, this one is, is separate. Yeah, good question. Um, and so does that mean you guys are the main sort of contributors to the system and the, the marketers are maybe contributing to their own system and then you decide periodically what to pull into the vault or how does that work? Correct. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're, we're exclusive. So we, uh, we can upload when we need to and figure out how to, how to do that. But, um, but we're, we're separate and we control all of the content that comes in. That's great. So uh, we just have a couple minutes left. I was just wondering if you could like, where do you see this going in the next year, a couple of years, you've had quite a while to get it looking pretty stable. Is it, is it more just maintaining at this point or are you still kind of actively developing features? Uh, obviously, maintaining uh, we we have new uh, new materials coming in all the time. We can improve it, but we're uh, we're we we continue to look forward. That's why the experiment with AI was a good one. It, it uh, came at the request of our design team, and uh, we did a little testing for. Uh, we have an annual hackathon here at the company, and it um, pushed us to to consider what we could do. So we're always interested in, in looking at what might be possible. But for us, we're pretty conservative about that. Uh, we don't want to, um, we're very careful about how we maintain our data. So we haven't jumped in, um, in in a huge way with AI, but I can imagine that that might be something we continue to look forward uh, to and then see what what's possible. Great, well, thanks so much. Um, I think we're going to, we have to switch over to the next session pretty soon here, but I wanted to thank Tracy for this really fascinating uh, story of the kind of a very impressive program you've managed to put together with just two people. Um, and if you didn't get a chance to get your question answered, I'm sure Tracy would be happy to share more of the specifics with you offline um, or in another forum.